Vibragenics. Vibragenics. Vibragenics.com. I am addicted. There's nothing like it. Your patients will thank you for it. You will see healing in your practice like never before. Well, my logical mind told me that if we are frequency and an energy system, why aren't we using that as the medicine to treat people? Well, welcome. I'm Dr. Caroline. I am the CEO and founder of Vibrogenics, and I'm so excited to be here today with Dr. Jeffrey Tucker, one of my absolute favorite people on the planet. I just love and respect you so much, and I really appreciate you taking the time here today. And I wanted to kind of talk about what my goal is, and I think we share the same goal for 2024. So I really want everybody to release, like there's been so much crap in the last three years, to be very, very blunt. It's all kinds of drama and trauma and all kinds of illnesses and things like that. I want people to get to a point of absolutely releasing that. And if that means, you know, doing a meditation where you have a big mirror behind you and you can only look forward, then that's what it takes for a little while. Do that meditation every day, whatever it takes to refocus your energy in the now and in the future, and then regenerate, start regenerating and rejuvenating the body, uh, regenerating the mitochondria, everything on a cellular level, atomic level, vibrational level, mind, body, and spirit, and then hit that big reset button as we go into 2024, because I really want to see everybody start thriving in 2024. And I know that you have come up with Tucker's 10 tips for 2024, and I cannot wait to hear them. But mm. tell us a little bit more about yourself and, and your practice and all of that. Well, first of all, I want to say thank you for allowing me to share this time. And I love when I get to be with you because I have such admiration and respect for you. And when you and I have been together and have opportunities to collaborate and share ideas and percolate, like what we see happening out there in the healthcare arena, there's always like some good things that we can share. And I think that's what you and I are all about is really trying to, you know, share what we've learned with our patients and our audiences. And if we can give like people just like one new idea a day, I think that that's really worthwhile. And I would start out for 2024 with asking my patients, what's their intention word for 2024? It's like one word, one inspirational word, one intentional word that you wanna really embody in the year ahead. It's got to be one word. And then I always write it down in my records and I'll ask the patients throughout the year, how's it going? So that's an important thing. Do you have one word? I have one word. I was just thinking about that. I really, effortless keeps coming to mind, like an effortless flow because it's been such a struggle, especially in the last year. I've had some twists and turns with my health, um, with the business, with all kinds of things that caused a lot of stress. And I really want everything to just flow and be abundant and be effortless. Mm. Not okay. that I'm not going to work hard. <laughs> Can you see what I'm doing? Yes. I'm writing it down. Effortless. Yes. That was good. And actually in 2023, the most common words that I heard were related to reducing stress, mm -hmm. people wanting less stress. And then I think that's part of effortless. I started thinking yeah. about yeah. my word towards the end of last year. And I actually struggled this year with what it would be. I had three words that I picked initially and then another two, and then I couldn't remember what they were. So that tells me right there, they didn't stick. <laughs> but I did wind up with permission. Permission for me to pause, think about my answer. Uh, oftentimes, and I know this about you as well, we both are, are ready to say yes when people ask us to do something. It's you know our inclination that we want to help. But sometimes we, it's better maybe we pause and say to ourselves, do we, you know, it's, 
should we say yes or no and permission to do that or permission to allow yourself to go away permission to you know create less effort for you so i i like your word a lot and i wrote it down and throughout the year i'm going to ask you how's it going and the other thing that i like to do in my chiropractic practice with my patients now, I am a chiropractor for over 42 or three years, and it's just been remarkable. I still love going to work every day. I still love, you know, learning and, and trying out you know, uh, some of these newer things that are available to us, the technology and blending it. It's, I see it all blending together. Um, many things that uh, you and I are involved in, and hopefully we could talk about. But I like to give patients a challenge. Last year in 2023, my challenge was for all of my patients to be able to try to put on three pounds of muscle, gain three pounds of muscle. And that was really a great challenge because as we age, muscle is like gold. It's really uh, remarkable. We know that as we age, we lose it. And it gave me a chance to have that conversation with patients. Well, what can they do, you know, exercise wise or diet wise, or, th you know, just their thought processes about it. And it was really fun to see as the year went along, how many people really did accomplish that and what it did for their physicality and their moods and mm -hmm. their overall health. So that was really great. And then in 2024, my challenge for patients is all about regaining and maintaining lost range of motion. Because I've always said, if you come in, Caroline, and you demonstrate that you have a loss of range of motion in your neck or a shoulder or your low back or your hips, whatever it is, let's regain as much as we can. Let's get that back and then never lose it. And the, to me, that's healthy aging, and even anti-aging, yes. right? That's my strategy. So that guides my conversation with patients. This, how can we increase your range of motion? And there's many ways people could do that at home on their own or in the office. And you know, it'll bring us to some of the technology, i.e. the fibrogenics that we use or lasers that we can stack it with or shockwave that we can stack it with or the car therapy, some of these things. But the most important thing is really being able to demonstrate to a patient, you can increase your range of motion and let's figure out ways to do it. So that's my challenge for 24, which I'm really excited about. And then you asked me, I think about uh, the top 10, right? Yes. That, you might want to know that. So in my top 10, and I'll preface it by saying that I, I have hopes for everybody that they really have, you know, increased health in their life. You and I know what it's like to be with people that are in constant chronic pain or ongoing pain, and they've tried different things. We've had different issues in our own lives uh, or people that we love that are close to us. So we just know how precious it is and that you should never stop trying to be healthier, yeah. right? Isn't that an important Absolutely. Absolutely. You never know how healthy you could be. That's true. So for me, in my practice, it's always getting down to the basics. Let's make sure that the foundational things are in place. Mm -hmm. And those foundational things are going to help influence the patients on a cellular level. So mm -hmm. number one for me is breath work. And I want everybody to always be nasal breathing. Mm -hmm. So many people are mouth breathers. True. So if I can get them to just focus on, you know, let's do your nasal breathing. And then what, and by the way, while they're on the vibrogenics, these are concepts that I'm asking patients to do and, you know, really participate in. Practice your nasal breathing, practice your belly breathing. If you're breathing through the chest, let's shut that down. Let's quiet it down. 
And these are all things that they could do while they're on the vibrogenics and practice. And the other big thing, so number two tip is hydration. I love to hear your thoughts. And I'm going to tell you what I've been doing for the past 60 days or so. I've been front loading my hydration in the morning. So I'm doing about 90 ounces of water within 90 minutes of being awake. And this That's is great. interesting. I know I, I wanted to hear your thoughts. Yeah. I put, I have this. Can you see that? This is yes. one of my jars, right? I'm going to have a sip. <laughs> and I can put in, you know, flavored, whatever, you know, a protein drink or some kind of drink to give it flavor. But what I've noticed is that my workouts are better. I always work oh, out every sure. morning. Right. So it is very different. I'm still drinking the same amount of water throughout the day that I normally do, but I have all this extra water now. And yes, I'm running to the bathroom more frequently, but at night I'm not as thirsty. Right. And that seems to be a good thing too, right? Less like frequent wake up you know, during the right. night if it's to go to the bathroom, you know, one time or two time. It's like, sometimes that's not even happening now. No, so, I love that. I love that. But what I also do is try to front load. I think it's a great concept and it does keep you from either not drinking enough water through the day because you've got a good chunk of it out of the way in the morning, not getting you up at night, but also putting uh, ginger, you can grind up ginger, put ginger and lemon in your water. You'll alkalinize your body. You'll help flush out your gallbladder and liver. Really, really healthy and healing. So I think that uh, the audience really needs to hear that. And you and I have had great talks about it. And you were the one who said to me, Jeff, cut up little pieces of ginger, put it in your water mm -hmm. or eat it throughout the yeah. day. And I thought that was such a great suggestion. And then I think it's really important too that patients do start monitoring their pH, right? Absolutely, absolutely. So because because your pH, when you're over acid, you are your body, the petri dish becomes the perfect fertile ground for all kinds of diseases and especially cancer. It thrives in an acidic environment. And most people, if they check their pH, they're over acid. So just ginger by itself, it's the most alkalinizing food you can eat. And it is profound. There's all kinds of, you know, pills and powders and all kinds of other things that people do. Yes. Ginger is more effective. I have tried one way and I have tried the other. Ginger is by far more effective. So I actually keep it on a little cutting board and I just cut off little pieces and it's a snack throughout the day. Put it in my water along with lemon in the morning. Keep my pH where it needs to be. I have a nice ginger extra. Oh, nice. Yeah that it's I'm putting in water or mixing it um, with uh, other things that are, you know, it's just delicious to sip. And yeah. that has, you know, uh, definitely does have an effect on our pH. And I just think that to restore energy and to restore some of, you know, the things that we talk about on a cellular level, this is really foundational. And, and it's right up there, like it's really like in that number three tip with diet, right? I really yeah. want to help people dial in their diet, whether it's a keto or Mediterranean or paleo or vegetarian, you know, usually it's low carb, right? But I want people to show me that they're eating a variety of whole foods. That's right. hugely important, right? And that we're lowering, you know, the sugar content is an absolute um, healthy fats are impro important. The lean proteins are important. What's your diet been these days? I'm curious. So <clears throat> I think, you know, I have a master's in nutrition and what I've seen over the years is everybody's different, right? Some people thrive <laughs> better on certain kinds of foods than others. And I know, I, I believe I recommended fish to you and you're not, a, you're not a big fan. I'm not. Fish may not work for you, right? It may not work for you. And according to, you know, there's the blood type 
aspect of it too. I don't hang my hat on any one theory, but I take pieces from everything. I think you figure out what resonates with you. I think everybody has their own internal physician. You can tell whether you feel better or worse after you've had a steak. You can tell whether you feel better or worse after you've had McDonald's. You're going to feel worse, by the way. Um, <clears throat> but adapting that, I try to take out all processed foods, eat from nature, absolutely eat from nature. Um, I try to concentrate on vegetables, protein, really healthy, complex carbohydrates, like brown rice, things like that. Um, definitely staying away from the sugar as much as possible. That's very acidifying to the body and it's just not good for anybody. Uh, and the other thing that's super important is good fats. So especially with people with weight loss, if they're trying to lose weight and go on a fat-free diet, their body is going to hang on to all the fat that it has because it needs it for everything, absolutely everything. And, you know, your brain is mostly fat. <clears throat> so it needs it for thought processes. Um, I have everybody try to start cooking with sesame oil. Another really good one is avocado oil, but sesame oil, it quadruples its antioxidant content when you cook with it right? So you think about Asia, highest smoking rate in the world, lowest heart disease. They cook everything in sesame oil. So they're constantly adding in a powerful antioxidant to every meal. So that's all we use here in the house to cook with nice. is sesame oil. So something like that is a small tweak. We use toasted sesame oil because we like it, but eating avocados, eating olive oil, like, but don't heat it, put it on top of your food, your salads or whatever. Just really important to get those key elements that are close to nature as possible, as clean as possible. Drink really clean, filtered water, whatever your chosen one is. I'm not on a bandwagon with any particular system. Just make sure it's really clean. Out of glass is really important. No more Out plastics. Of glass. Right? We definitely Out of glass. You know, are putting all our plastics aside for years now, and hopefully everybody is doing that. And I have to t tell you, you went right through tip number four and five and almost six as you oh, were talking. Which is, no, it's so this... great because look, it's um, on on the diet side, you know, and helping people figure out what's best for them. We have to talk about weight management. You know, I am very okay being that doctor that can look a patient in the eye and go, "Look, let's. You need to lose weight. You're you're five percent over a healthy body fat that in and of itself can produce cytokines and inflammation most people have heard of cytokines by now these are and this impacts your inflammation i need patients oftentimes just to go lose some weight reduce their inflammation and then i know who they really are what's left after that yeah and in that weight management tip you said it, you know, let's limit our processed foods. Let's have antioxidant rich foods. For me, the next tip that I make sure is that everybody has to have their omegas intact. So if I'm not eating yes. fish, I have to take my extra omega-3, you know, fatty acids. Yes. And Super I can measure that by doing a bio impedance analysis test. So in the office, we use the four lead. Are you familiar with that one? You know, two on the wrist and two on the foot. Mm -hmm. And it runs a current through the body that you don't even feel. And I get so much information out of that one, Dr. Caroline. It's, it gives me the phase angle, which is literally, right. literally, you know, that cell membrane health. How fast a current can go through your cell membrane is vitally important to know. And I think it's probably one of the most underutilized numbers and so simple to do. And that device also helps me measure their hydration. How are you doing with your water inside the cell versus outside? I want everybody's cells to be like a nice juicy grape, not like a raisin, no. right? <laughs> There's consequences of dehydration. Really, yes. there's serious you know, consequences of this. People don't realize that. And so it's nice to be able to measure and say to somebody, look, you need to double up on your omega-3s. Let's make sure it's a good brand. And then I can retest them you know, in a couple of few months. And we see that phase angle number going up, which is really, really, truly 
you know, a marker of cellular health, so important. And then helping people get their protein dialed in as well. And yeah. uh, I want to talk to you about that. I, I want to hear some of your ideas on protein and protein sources. Where are you at with okay. that? So I am a huge believer in wild caught fish. I don't ever eat farm fish. If you visited a fish farm and looked at the water, you'll know why. <laughs> they are just not healthy. It's not a healthy environment. So I don't eat farm fish at all. I do eat wild caught um, salmon quite a bit and ahi. I think those are really good sources. But if you don't like fish, definitely take a really good fish base, like uh, wild Alaskan salmon, wild caught base omega-3 is really good for you. Um, there are other, you know, really good forms of omegas too. There's quite a few of them available now, just making sure it's a really good brand. As far as chicken, I there are there's a lot of disease in chickens. There's a lot of cancer, there's prions, there's there's all kinds of disease. So I think it's sure you can get organic free range chicken uh, and eat that if you'd like. If you're B blood type, chicken doesn't really agree with you in the first place. I much prefer turkey. It's usually much cleaner. It's much easier to digest. Most people get along with turkey a lot better than they do with chicken. Although it's amazing how many people still eat just regular store-bought chicken. Um, I think that depending on your blood type and your personal chemistry, eating a really good uh, form of grass-fed beef can be a really great form of protein. Uh, that's one, the one area where you really have to watch your pH because meat is acidifying to the body. So if you're going to eat meat, I don't take people away from stuff that they love if it's good, still good for them, but I add in like more ginger or something to counter the fact that if you're eating more red meat, you're going to be more over acid. So counter that with bringing in more alkalinizing foods. So citrus, you know, like lemons are very alkalinizing, which confuses a lot of people <clears throat> because they're acidic when you take them, when you drink it, consume it, when it's absorbed and metabolized, it becomes an alkaline. The same thing is true for coffee, which people don't realize it's very acidic in your stomach, but when it's metabolized, it's alkalinized. So <clears throat> moderation in all things, of course, <laughs> um, but I don't try and uh, eliminate that sort of thing. I do try to stay away from or recommend people stay away from things that are bottom feeding. So, mm -hmm. you know, your lobster, crab, you know, shrimp, all those kind of things that feed off the bottom. I think what they bring in is, you know, you are what you eat. So I try to limit those kind of things. Um, but it's very important to get good protein. And if you can't get enough good protein, there are some good organic um, vegan proteins, even for people that are vegan, like protein powders. We use a lot of Orgain. It's mm -hmm. a good one. And I supplement. I've been doing that for years with my kids just to make sure they get enough protein in their diet. Protein. Tofu tofu works really well for some people. There's a huge controversy out there on soy. Right. Um it has a lot of phytoestrogens. So giving soy milk, uh, tofu, soy products to younger people, it can cause such an increase in those phytoestrogens that they say boys, and I've seen this before, can actually start um, developing breast tissue, that sort of thing. For postmenopausal women, Tofu, soy products are a good choice because our estrogens are going so low in the first place and you need to boost those estrogens. So it all depends on who you are, where you're at and your, your point in life and moderation again, in all things. I don't think, I think having a balance is good. I think you can always overdo it by eating a very limited diet and your body will become sensitive and develop a, a moderate or mild allergy to it for a while until you go off it. So if you're doing too many eggs, it can develop a sensitivity to eggs. Mm -hmm. I did that to myself. So mm -hmm. one of my favorite body. foods, I crave, uh, yeah. I crave the choline. I love yeah. an egg yolk. And yeah. uh, that that's and that, there's nothing, nothing wrong with that. I think the only reason I gave myself a sensitivity and it went away, but it was years ago, I was bodybuilding. 
And mm. I was vegetarian and my trainer is like, you have to get more protein. You have to get more protein. So I would do 12 egg whites and one egg yolk. You know, that was my morning breakfast. <laughs> it's 36 grams of protein, you know? Yeah, and part, yeah it was, it was excessive. Well, so try yeah. not to be excessive in anything, you know, in yeah. supplements, in your diet, try to be balanced, use clear judgment in what you're choosing and pay attention to what resonates with your body. I think on this, you know, big bucket of diet, there's, there's two things that I really like to help patients with is figure out how many grams of protein they need a day. And oftentimes really when people are doing a diary and they're calculating their total number of, you know, protein in grams per day, they are under the amount. Yeah. As we get older, we do need a little bit more. And, and I, you know, yeah. I speak from this, that uh, I'm the elder in the room. Uh, and I find that, it, you know, as I've aged, my practice has aged as well. And I can really see those patients that are doing well. It's an, It's been such an incredible experiment, you know, in my yeah. laboratory, so to speak, like who is aging well? And those that have maintained good protein amounts, good quality protein, you know, the foods that we're talking about are doing well. And I know that there's lots of, you know, calculations and thoughts on that. But for me, once I've done body composition analysis, I know how much lean muscle mass they have on their body. You know, everything minus their fat mass is their lean muscle mass. And that's how many grams of protein. I want them to have per day. And oftentimes they do need to have a good quality day to get the amount that's required. And I, I think you, we may not have said it, but I know you and I have talked about the prebiotic foods or probiotic foods, maybe having some sauerkraut or mm -hmm. some of the fermented foods. Any thoughts on that that you would want no, to I share? Think it's really good for digestion yeah. i think so is ginger i mean anything you can do to mm -hmm. keep your digestive tract in optimum shape and sometimes yeah. people need additional probiotics not just prebiotics right. it depends on where your body is you just need to balance it there's no one set prescriptive formula for anyone but it's do you have important a favorite I that you like fermented food uh, probably the organic fermented sauerkraut. I love that. Yeah, me too. <laughs> it's simple. <laughs> it's easy. It's simple yeah. and it's really good. <laughs> That's a good one. So on, on the next, you know, tip that I would talk to patients about is their alcohol consumption. And, uh, you know, I, I know that this could be so controversial, right? That, um, well, a little bit of wine could be good or, you know, a little bit of spirits can be good, but, you know, I'm so concerned about people's blood sugar levels and this excess amount of alcohol. You know, I just want to have a conversation about it with patients. I'm not asking them to completely stop, but, you know, I want to know how much they're consuming and maybe have a conversation about what is the right amount. I know for me, if I have a glass of wine or, you know, I've realized when I would have a glass of wine, I would always wake up at two o'clock in the morning, three o'clock in the morning, wide awake because of the sugar, you know, that it would, it would spike. And some people, you know, can dabble with maybe one ounce, literally, like it's like a little bit of a sip and it doesn't affect them that much. And that could be satisfying, you know, taste. What are your thoughts on that one? Um, so I think it's a conversation that really, truly needs to be addressed. And I think it's part mm -hmm. of the release. Alcohol consumption during the pandemic went up 62%. And so mm -hmm. did domestic violence, divorce, all kinds of other things, depression, all of that. And alcohol is a depressant. And I think that, you know, the major reasons people drink are <clears throat> anxiety and depression. So I think addressing those two things, and that's why I love on um, Vibrogenics, the mood elevation frequencies, because it has anxiety and depression put together. And in yeah. fact, when I'm treating for somebody for alcoholism with the technology, we run the anxiety, depression, and alcoholism together. And it just 
takes mm -hmm. away that desire because you're taking away you're taking away the causative factors. So really important to <clears throat> release and reset. I mean, it's just like I'm saying, it's it feels like all the clients that I've been seeing and all the people I've been talking to are literally walking, like dragging a, a bar stool, you know, kind of like one of these hooked on their leg. And that's the past three years. And they are trying to, you know, get up speed and maybe thrive in 2024. But there's things weighing you down and the increase in alcohol consumption, definitely one of those. And especially for people that don't drink a lot in the past, that's mm -hmm. a hard subject for them to even talk about. They don't even want to admit it out loud, but I think it's a conversation that really needs to be had and, and not from a judgmental point of view from a, I understand we're in this together. This happened to us as a nation, you know, the 62% increase was across the nation. And it was really good for alcohol sales and not so much for everybody's livers and kidneys and brains. Oh, good, <laughs> but, good, for um, good. I, I think it's really important that if you, you know, all things in moderation, including moderation. And, you know, my husband has this theory that, you know, you don't drink anything except for water and whatever he does mm -hmm. <laughs> from <clears throat> Sunday through Friday. And then be really moderate Friday and Saturday, and then do it again. So practice really clean living. And if you do, it's uncomfortable, I know, to go out to a celebration and party and all that where everybody else is consuming alcohol. And especially being around people that are drinking, it changes people's personalities a little bit, and it makes you more uncomfortable sometimes. So if you're in that situation, you have a drink, that's fine. With people, I'm really watching their acid because they have cancer, they've had it in the past, or they have type two diabetes, or they have lupus or um, any kind of arthritis. And the alcohol is so acidifying, it makes that condition worse. So I say, if you're going to have a drink or two, make sure that you do some extra alkalinizing things the next morning and take extra B vitamins. So your body burns through B vitamins light speed when you're under stress mental, emotional, physical stress, and especially when you drink alcohol. So definitely. That's a good one. One, a of good one. one of my tips on that is having patients uh, have a little bit of charcoal, a charcoal tab yes. before yes. they know, you know, that they already know that they're going to go out to drink. Right. That's Not excellent health, as well. Right. And, and one of my other tips is increasing everybody's fiber this year. I'm really having that conversation with all of my patients. Uh, most people have a, maybe 10 to 20 grams of fiber per day. And I'm trying to get everybody to increase it like at least 10, maybe even closer to 20 grams more on top of what you're already having. So it's worthwhile, you know, if you can try to keep a little bit of a diary, figure out what your average, you know, grams of fiber per day is. And let's really increase it because that helps soak up toxins, doesn't it? it and does. it's just and it for our overall health, this is so important. So whatever well, it looks really like for people, right? There, it could be, you know, uh, flax seed, flax flour, chia. There's so many great options for to increase our fiber. Those, the vegetables themselves yeah, are vegetables. I'm the queen of vegetables. I'm part rabbit. <clears throat> so I get all my, I get all my fiber from uh, vegetables for sure. I don't do any additional supplements for that, but fiber is really important for keeping everything really moving through your intestinal tract and for preventing any kind of intestinal cancer. And I've been down that road before. So I really pay attention to my fiber intake. My diet mostly consists of vegetables and good protein. That's what I focus on. I'm yeah. not big on eating a lot of fruit and I do like lemon because it's alkalinizing, but I, I believe that fruit is God sugar, you know? So it's yeah. a nice thing to have for dessert. Yeah, exactly. Mm. I will uh, often, you know, tell patients, look, you can have one or two pieces of fruit per day max. And, you know, I like them to have the berries. Look, they have great antioxidants. They're very antioxidant rich. So that's okay. I mean, yes, it is a, a good dessert or a good lunchtime dessert, yeah. really. Or if you Maybe have low blood dinner. sugar. Yeah. Yeah. Low and blood that, sugar is that, good for bringing that up. And and that brings me to the next tip, you know, after the conversation with alcohol is dinner time and sleep. I want all of my patients to stop eating three hours before bedtime. 
and I want them to increase their sleep by an hour for 2024, either going to bed earlier or winding down earlier or sleeping in an extra hour. I'm really after that. I just think we need more you know, rest and digest time. We uh, can enhance our sleep, our REM sleep, our deep sleep, our heart rate variability by not eating late. And I know that's really hard for people to do, but uh, lighter meals, you know, in the evening help that cause. But I, I, I am pretty adamant about working with patients to get better sleep. Yes. Do you have any thoughts you, on that one? Yeah, so you know, there's nothing, not a single modality, supplement, anything else that you can find or do that is more regenerating for the body than sleep. That's yeah. when we really start to heal. And I think it's really important for the mind too to have that downtime. <clears throat> so I'm a huge advocate on the sleep. As far as late dining, you don't sleep as well at yeah. all. <laughs> and no. it's harder to go to sleep. I actually am a big fan of eating early. You know, I don't like to eat past, you know, four o'clock. Sometimes if I had had a late lunch, so I'm good to go. I get to bed early, get a good night's sleep. And that gives you your nice long period of intermittent fasting if you need it. And mm -hmm. that's good for insulin resistance as well. So people look at intermittent fasting as being, you know, this huge thing and ordeal to undertake, but it's really not that hard if your last meal is at 2 p.m. or 4 p.m. You know, by the time you get up the next morning and you have your breakfast, you've gone 14 hours anyway. So that that's is good. enough, especially for women. That's enough. You don't want to get into too many of the low blood sugar issues. Great. So good. yeah, good I'm a big voice. fan of that. Yeah. yeah, good. I'm glad. I I know we have a lot of agreement, you know, on these things yes. that are trying to point people in, you know, a, a better direction, hopefully. And then the next tip, my ninth one, I think that if I count them out now, what we've talked about would be talking about exercise. So for mm -hmm. me, the mother of all exercise is still walking. So if you're not moving or you're deconditioned, then I want you to get walking. If you're already walking, then I want you to walk faster. And my goal for this year is I want people to be at least 100 steps in a minute. So you, you take your phone and you put on your timer for one minute and you hit go and you start counting your steps. And my minimum that I want people to be at is 100. And that would be considered a pretty like moderate to brisk walk. You don't have to do that the entire time. It's okay to cycle fast and then go to your normal pace. But if I if you're already at 100, then I'm going to challenge you to go to 110. If you're at 110, I'm going to challenge you to go to 120. And this will help kind of get get your breath, you know, a little bit faster, which is fine. It's good for the cardiovascular system. And if that all sounds easy, then we could put in some sprints. Maybe that 20 to 30 second all out sprints during your walk. And uh, I combine that or stack it. I am um, blessed I get to live at the beach. So yeah. at least one or two days a, a week, you know, I go out, I'm barefoot on the sand. I walk. I literally I'll walk from like one trash can, you know, to the next, and then I'll run. So I'm doing it like an intermittent, you know, walking and running, and it's good cardio, like getting to ground. And if people can't do that, right? If they just they can't do that, can't can't find the time to walk, uh, you, you can't get it, you know, some cardio or weightlifting or whatever you know we want you to do, which is you know body weight, whatever it is. I want you jumping. So this is this is big, Caroline. This is. Uh, like a minimum requirement that I want people to do this year is jump up and down 20 times a day. I used to say this, do your squats, do your push-ups for osteopenia, osteoporosis prevention, but I really want people jumping up and down now. And that could just look like a very easy, you know, jump up and down, right? I don't know if you can see me, but you know, this might be like that, right? And, Eventually, over time, you'll go higher and higher. 
but I think we need that dress, you know, for the, that osteopenia, osteoporosis. And for, for the lymphatic time. movement. And for lymphatic movement, it's incredible. I love body weight yeah. swings for my lymphatic drainage. And that these are great things, by the way. You know, I know we're going to get to talk about vibrogenics, but I do have patients doing their swings on the vibrogenics. And, and I, you know, I do easy jumps while I'm on it as well. And I, I think that kind of, you know, I want to have those conversations about the vibrogenics with you. Uh, but the last one, I think it's kind of like a number 11. And I know that you and I have cultivated, you know, tremendous relationships with other practitioners. You know, when, when I, like, when I see you, you know, I have such admiration for your experience and what you've done, you know, it's, we, that we, we know who the good practitioners are to send, you know, individual people to, and we know products, we know products, I think really well. I love vetting products. I am an early adopter of yes. technology, you know, in, in laser and into car therapy and in shockwave and, you know, these different things that we might see in, in our offices, uh, you know, lymph drainage, like you mentioned, there's, there's many ways to do that. So I, I think that people need help with this. How do you, how do you sort out what is a good product? Why is it a good product? On so many different levels, it's confusing. And even we're confusing. I call up my friends, I call up you and I go, Hey, yeah. what do you think about this? Or do you have experience with that? And this is how we vet, you know, these things. So I think you and I, on a daily basis, we get to see what works. I had a couple of doctors call me on Friday that drifted into conversations on Saturday. And it was about some new products, uh, thermography, uh, shockwave. And these doctors just don't even always know, right? What to go with. And we, we've cultivated, I think, good people and good you know, knowledge about products. So-, so uh, Go ahead, go ahead. No, I, I was just thinking about the vibrogenics. It is, you know, the conversation because it's a way for me to really interact more with that actual patient in front of me. And I think you and I are boundary crossers. You know, we look okay. for, you know, right. What, what's, we've crossed the aisle between our different disciplines. Mm -hmm created bridges just to be able to figure out how to help people enhance their lives. Right. Right. And I, uh, I'll share with you and then you might know where, where to go, uh, this morning it's, it today is Sunday that we're doing this recording. And today is my, what I call my recovery day. And I, I'm on the vibrogenics doing 300 squats, 350 actually, and oh. 200, no, uh, 350 push-ups. And the way that wow. I built up to that, Caroline, is, uh, you know, over time, I do 25 at a time, 25 squats, 25 push-ups, back to back. And like at about 300, it really gets kind of boring, but I'm on the device, right? I'm using the whole body vibration. I'm having the frequency therapy while I'm on it. So I'm stacking it and I'm doing my body weight exercises. My philosophy on that, my thinking is, as I age, if I can continue to do that many, even if I drop down to 250, 150, am I doing good, right? Absolutely. Those are move, right? Those are movements that I want to have. I want to be able to do a squat. I want to be able to, you know, do a, a push up or, you know, do my jumps now that right. I'm really, you know. I love the fact that you're exercising on the vibrogenics because you tighten tone and build oh. muscle up to 50% faster if you do it on the vibrogenics. So that is fabulous. And, you know, speaking to what you mentioned about the different modalities, we, I just saw you at the A4M medical yes. conference, <clears throat> regenerative medicine. And it, kind of blew my mind. It was 30% larger this year, both with vendors like us being there and attendees like you. 
and there was over 4,500 doctors there. And they were all looking at, and I talked to so many MDs that were looking at regenerative medicine to bring into their practice. And you asked them why, and they said, because there's so many things we don't have the tools to address. We have drugs and surgery, but we can't seem to regenerate people, especially after the pandemic with the long haul COVID symptoms, you know, people aren't bouncing back, their immune systems are down. So they're looking for other tools and, you know, Walking around that show, you were as familiar as I was. There was an overwhelming amount of things there. And it's really hard to kind of discern what's the best and maybe what's not as good. And I thought it was very, very interesting that, you know, here we are 100% sound frequency therapy put right next to all the uh, mechanical vibrational machines. <laughs> I thought that was great. Great contrast. Didn't bother me it, at all. What It was an amazing experience because when we look back, you know, in the past, if I went to a big conference like that, maybe there was one red light bed, maybe two, mm -hmm. right? It must have been a dozen different ones. No. Uh, there was so much, like you just said, in the regenerative space, aesthetics incredible mm -hmm. there were so many different types of injections that you could be doing now uh, i i am having a hard time sorting it out you know and you yeah. speak to each one of these the vendors or the distributors and they all say theirs is the best right. they have fda approval and mm -hmm. we're better than this one or that one and i get how it's really overwhelming for the regular consumer i also will say this i think that the that are in healthcare, healthcare's largest blind spot is chronic persistent pain. And that pain may not be due to an organ or a structural disease. And what so many doctors are faced with, so many patients are faced with is something works for a while until it doesn't. And the sheen is worn off. And this is where, you know, we have to try to help people figure out all of these pieces of the tips or what technology to do. With all of my devices, I don't feel hopeless or helpless in helping people. And that's the beauty of this, that, you know, that we have the vibrogenics in the office. And what that looks like for me I mean, I think I'm a pretty long time user of it, right? I think I you got the one for your office maybe six years ago. Yeah, yeah. When and I here was you. the problem. Everybody got to use it in the office except me. <laughs> but it was like, right? Because as soon as yep. I walked in the door in the morning, uh, you know, I, the, the staff's asking me questions or right. I need to, you know, be on the phone, which I've already been on the phone as I'm driving in, you know, know. talking to other <laughs> doctors and patients, right? And, and then, you know, the day goes by and at the end of the day, you know, there's like paperwork that has to get done and then uh -huh. I want to get out, right? So, so I had to get one from home, yeah. right? I mean, it, it yep. was like one of the best gifts to myself, you know, and I have had, a you know, a few patients that have gotten it for home use as well. And I think that that's really re remarkable, but you know, they did that. And I, and I do encourage people, you know, if they're gonna buy themselves like a, a nice big present for the rest of their life, this is definitely on the list. Yeah. It's something you use every day. And I think when it comes to um, chronic issues in patients, one thing I've done for years and years and years is tried to isolate the root cause because there is always something that happened before the dominoes started falling and they, you know, started having this symptom and that symptom and the other symptom and this disease and whatever. There was always something that came first. So I've had it as wild as a black widow bite being the initial thing, mm -hmm. causing all kinds of heart trauma and heart attacks and things like that. I've had it be a trauma, either a traumatic emotional experience or a traumatic, you know, car accident, physical accident of some kind, but something stopped the flow of energy. <clears throat> the body didn't function well. And 
That's why I love also integrating Eastern medicine. I don't know where you stand on that. I know a lot of people think it's woo woo and out there, but it's not. I mean, those energy centers go right through your spine. That goes right through your nervous system. So you can actually study the function of the spine and you will see that that energy center is blocked. That area of the spine isn't functioning well. And all the nerves that go to the organs that innervate that part of the spine are not doing well. So if you can get those energy centers flowing, that trauma released and removed, uh, the body can actually have a real shot at healing itself. And I always try to like, <clears throat> when people come in, I get their most intense symptoms, most bothersome, and try to get at the root cause. And that always comes through conversation. And yeah. oh, addressing great. both of those at the same time, then you can get rid of stuff. And it's I, not just temporary fix. I agree. There's there's so much I want to, we get so excited, you know, talking about this. And I know that, you know, we so agree that uh, emotions, you know, trigger bodily changes. And I want to share some of the things that I've been doing with you, what I ask patients to do on the device. So in my office, picture this, my office is in, you know, Brentwood, uh, Los Angeles, California. And it, there's a lot of traffic in that area. It's really, you know, it's hectic. It's, it's, it's just a lot of traffic. So to get to the office, you know, people probably feel, you know, often rushed. Uh, they have to find a place to park. And we have a, you know, a parking structure. It's expensive. Like I'm always amazed at, you know, places I go visit around the country and these doctor's offices have all this free parking. It's amazing to me. Uh, but so people, then they have to come in, you know, they're coming upstairs. And by the time they like get in the office, it's almost like, I just need him to have this exhale. Okay. You've arrived, you've arrived, you're here. And one of the things they'll do if they're there early, they go right to the vibrogenics. They know we've already taught them, if, you know, if, if, if it's uh, not occupied, you know, go on. They've been taught how to use it and what to do. And then I I've, I've show them, I come over to them, you know, during a session that I'm with them actually, is I want them to start their breath work. You know, that what I talked about earlier, the breathing, concentrate on nasal breath, whatever, you know, they need to do. Is it box breathing? Is it the four, seven, eight? Whatever it is, I want them to do, you know, some focus on their breath work. And then I'm showing them what good posture is, you know, how to get connected, how rooted their feet, their knees, get their pelvis in neutral, get the ribs stacked properly, and then good head alignment. And I love when I see people, you know, practicing that. And then I might even go into some movement on the vibrogenics with them. That could just look like a one-legged stand or doing some squats. Or uh, one of the really good ones is where they're doing a one-legged stand and I have them do a toe touch onto the floor for ankle mobility. So if you're standing on your left leg, let's say uh -huh. your, your left leg kind of like at the edge, whatever it is, whichever edge, and then they take their opposite foot and they move that right foot forward to touch the floor it's great yeah. it's so simple it's a good glute activation and there's there's so many little exercises that i've figured out now to do on the vibrogenics that i think at some point we need to be together and just record that so i can share absolutely. that with people absolutely and, then, and doing range of motion is you get so much more enhanced yeah. effects if you do your range of motion exercises yeah. on the machine. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And and just trying to figure out where there's these restrictions and then creating that warming mm -hmm. response, you know, in a sense to that area is really important using the device. And then, like you said, there's a really big emotional dimension to this. So I might even have people, you know, standing I'm on the seventh floor, they're looking out, looking out, you know, over the treetops you know, to the mountains and really like looking out and then thinking about what is that unpleasant experience and release it, release it. And here they are, they're on the vibrogenics. They have this, you know, opportunity to have sound therapy come in and replace it, right? Really, 
place that unpleasant experience in their body or their thought or what occurred at work and just reawaken yeah. parts of their brain. Yeah. I want to say reawaken it is a, is maybe a good word that they they don't feel or fully awake. Or if you have a busy brain like you and I do, you know, we're just you and I are just too sympathetic, right? Dominant. Uh, try to get you know the brain to be quiet. And so having having the stimulation, having this you know the vibration. And the different sound therapies really does, you know, make a difference. It enhances it. For me, also as the doctor, I want to say that it improves or enhances patients' experience. I mean, let's face it, people are looking for experiences. And that's important. And I like, for me, uh, it makes it a more rewarding clinician experience having, you know, this type of technology in the office. Everybody feels better. You know, that release of any kind of trauma that happens on the machine. I mean, 10 minutes is equal to 90 minutes of Tai Chi or Qigong. And that's, those disciplines are all about getting energy flowing and releasing any energy blocks in the body. Yes. Yes. Creating awareness to where that is, is huge. Yes. yes, that's a big part. Like, you know, go from being unaware to aware. And, and I think that these, while they're being distracted in, in a sense with the therapy, oftentimes can reveal some of these things that we're looking for. And, and I get, I really do get, we're interacting with like the most complex, you know, thing on the planet right you know the the body the mind the body an individual a a person and a brain that learned to memorize pain or a brain that learned a bad habit or a posture that's not serving you that's contributing to pain in your body or even cancer I'm sure you'll agree, right? Even if the brain, you know, did something with cancer, can we unlearn these things? Can can we unlearn to do it? I, you must have I think thoughts. we can. I think I think you can. I think I'm a real strong believer in choice, right? What you choose. Mm-hmm. When you set the intention and you choose even something simple like I choose to be happy today, even though you don't feel happy at the time, right? If you choose that, it is amazing how things start shifting around you and more of that joy and happiness starts coming in. I think choosing to be healthy, choosing to have whatever that core problem is be released, I think is really important. I think that's the one one big step. And I know that another thing that I faced a lot in my practice was people, sometimes people's diseases serve them. And I would always ask people when they came in, especially with advanced cases that were really complex, do you want to be well? And they either instantly would say yes, or they would take a pause. And Mm. I said, you know, no wrong answer here, but your next assignment before you come back in is make two lists. This is all the ways that my disease is serving me. And this is what my life would look like if I was completely well. And I will never forget it. I had two really advanced, very similar cases in the same day. And one lady was instantly, yes, I want to be well. And so we never did that exercise with her. The other one was a long pause. She sat back in her chair. I gave her the assignment. She went home and she says, well, here's my list. And I looked at it and the way it was serving her, she didn't have to work anymore. She had a housekeeper. She had a cook. She didn't have to, you know, run the kids around or do anything as far as taking care of the family. And she got her time to herself. And on the other side, if she was healthy again, she would have to go back to work. She'd have to start cooking, clean, doing all of these things. And she decided that she didn't want to get well. She liked mm-hmm. the new lifestyle and she didn't, she passed away about four months later. 
So people have to choose and you have to honor their choice. It's like you and I, we want to heal everybody. We want everybody to be well. We want everybody to thrive. We want everybody to be happy, especially on the healthy part. If there's anything we can do to influence mm -hmm. their health, <clears throat> but it's still a choice for them, whether they want to be healthy or not. Yeah. And that was the hardest thing for me to learn. <laughs> it's still mm -hmm. honor the choice. Yes. I feel like there's as practitioners um, where we have to be able to connect with that is so important and then understand how much stimulus that individual can handle, whatever, whatever it is in conversation or showing them exercises or diet, uh, all the lifestyle things, right? Like, you know, we have to almost try to feel what they feel so not to overwhelm them i don't want to overwhelm people and they don't do anything that's right. not a good thing and so that's why sometimes it's so easy to start with breath work or you know yes. explore some movement and and kind of let you know hey this is safe right mm -hmm. it's safe let's you know let's start reducing the threat and then we have a plan i actually you know i found that when i really i love listening to patient stories i really love hearing the whole story. And I have to tell them when they first come in, I'm like, okay, listen, wait, I, I need to go back all the way back, all the way back, early, early childhood, you know, things that you might remember. And I like it in a timeline. You know, I really do. I like them to go in a timeline. And uh, I, I, we have to kind of figure out like, if there were traumas, what was resolved, what's not resolved. Uh, and then remove those threats that keep going forward. I think, right, isn't that part of it? We have to try to, we're, we're people move, health, healthcare movers. <laughs> we, wanna, we wanna move your healthcare right. along. Like what is the next level? What is the next thing that you could do? And these frequencies are very, I think they've been underutilized. I think vibration sure. is really underutilized, but it's coming, isn't it? Like we really feel, yes. You know, that now is its time. It's it's emerging. You know, we're kind of, I think we're going, it's like in the physical therapy space, uh, shockwave therapy, it's like it's time, you know, laser kind of. Right. You know, yeah. you, people got into lasers, people got into shockwave. Uh, now, now they're asking about some of these heat therapies and or frequency therapies. Right, right. And I think the sound frequency medicine component is really coming, starting to come into its own. I mean, there's been vibration for a long time and yeah. there was some early sound vibration and chiropractors were the first ones to just get it. You know, they just got it. They'd get on yeah. the machine and go, wow. And then we had all these inexpensive mechanical machines. Yeah. Not all of them are inexpensive. Blood, the industry. And so my biggest challenge at the chiropractic shows I've gone to in the last few years is people walk by and say, yeah, I've got one. I don't like it. I don't ever get yeah. on it. And if I can talk, <laughs> if I can tell them this is not a mechanical biplate, this is right. sound frequency medicine, you know, infused with sound vibration only, sonic vibration only, they jump right on it and try. Yeah. So I think it's, it's differentiating what's been there you know, the, the saturation in the industry that wasn't real helpful for the body because mechanical, I mean, it doesn't do anything to increase the energy inside your cells, which is really the key to the body healing itself. But, you know, live blood cell analysis shows that vibrogenics does that. So just getting people more aware of what it can do for the body and that the effects are cumulative and they're not temporary. Um, it's taken a lot of education, a lot of patience, a lot of time, but I think it's finally time and people are looking for answers on sound frequency medicine. So I'm excited about that turn of events. Me too. And it's not new. <laughs> it's not new. It's it just new and took a hundred like years it. to come to this, come to the light. <laughs> I, I like it for so many things, you know, in, in my practice, uh, even, even for fatigue, you know, or or muscle soreness, or the arthritics, or um, I, I like it, you know, for compression, decompression, the concepts of the, the fascia. I mean, clearly, when the patients come in and they do it before their session, they're, they're so much more ready in an accepting way physically, you know, and emotionally, 
to be able to accept, you know, other parts of the treatment, whether that's hands-on or whether it is some of the other technologies, PEMF or, you know, light therapy, sound therapies. And uh, I know, I know with certainty that it increases the blood flow, the lymph flow, you know, the oxygenation to the tissues. So it's even a great compliment right after, you know, after their sessions with me. So I really like it. And I, I have a couple of tips that I don't know if you've been doing or not, but I wanted to run this one by you. Share them. I have two that I wanted to share. Yeah, you want me to do this? Uh, all right. So here's here's one of the things I'm finding. I like taping patients before they go on the vibrogenics. Okay. Right, the kinesio tape. Right. Right? So that's compression, decompression. The tape is moving you like this, right? It, it's taking, you know, the fashion, it's kind of like picking it up a little bit. And we know that it does increase like superficial blood flow. So guess what? When they're on the vibration and they're getting the sound therapy, guess what's happening with the tape? It's wow. even getting more, right? So I like that. It, I'm going to have to try that. We do on the paraspinals or wherever we need to do it, you know, over an area. So it's just like giving a little more focus to that. And then I don't know if anybody's really talked about this, but you know, I, f- I find that when people are on the vibrogenics and I get to kind of walk up to them and they're, you know, they're doing their practice, I can see they're doing their breathing or they're doing, you know, checking posture. Nobody's allowed on their cell phone when they're on the vibrogenics. Um, like yeah, no electronics at that time. Um, I will come up to them and I might start touching and feeling or, you know, massaging. Like shoulders. Or starting my palpation. Right. Where, you know, and there is this thing. It's not just like I'm touching you, right? It's, it's, I think that there's that oxytocin burst. I mean, we know that, right? right. When you have a human touch, there's that oxytocin burst. And I, I just, I think that, that we're on the vibration plus massage, we're inducing a little bit more pain relief to the joints and the muscle pain, right? And then this whole immune system cascade, which we haven't even talked about yet for this. So another time have to do that, yeah. it's enhanced. So I, I don't know how many practitioners or, you know, people at home that have them or you know, it's almost like, yes, it could be your alone space, your alone time. Okay, leave me alone. I'm going on the vibrogenics, right? <laughs> or it could be, hey, I'm going on the vibrogenics. Do you mind, you know, massaging my back for a few minutes? And my sore, you know, shoulders, right? So it, I, I, have, I have the Elite machine at home. So it has the bigger plate. And yeah. every morning, every morning, my husband and I get on it together. Oh, and like he'll stretch and I'll rub his back or he'll rub my neck. So I think that's perfect. And I do that with patients sometimes too. And my uneasy way to do it was with the cell exciters too. You know, I'll put the cell exciter on and then maybe massage around there. And I'm a Reiki master too. So I feel like, and I think you're a natural healer as well. So I think anytime you can put that healing touch on people, it's very, very helpful. I think it's more than just the oxytocin. But it's <laughs> yeah. we'll we'll talk about that next time. There you so go. I, Thank you so much for your uh, time. I just, I just adore love you. you. Thank you. Say hi to everybody for me. I will. Thank All you right. so much. Thank you. Have a wonderful weekend. Bye. Bye.